Okay, does that mean it's my, it's me? People seem to be coming in, so I wasn't sure if we wanted to give it another minute. Yeah, I would say give it another minute and then uh, pe people still dribble in, but it's up to you from now, Maggie. You're on. <laughs> I was watching for uh, Kelly and Hadi. I know. I feel like it's we, we at least have to have all the presenters here before we start. <laughs> Kelly has just arrived, I see. Hello. This is making a lot more sense now. So. Kelly dropped in on our stand-up ah. meeting earlier. I saw a quick entry and a quick exit, and I thought, huh, I wonder who that was. No, I, I was just trying to make sure I could actually log on. <laughs> so. Yeah, perfect. And there's Hadi as well. And I think we, we all want to share a screen, right? So we probably need to be promoted to. Yeah, Matt, are you taking care of that or, or Gene? So there's, there's no promotion since this is just a standard Zoom account. So this is not a webinar, for instance. Okay. You should have the ability, but Tara, why don't you just give it a give it a try, um, screen share, and then we'll make sure it works. For everyone joining us, we're just doing a quick check-in and then we'll get started. Um, as soon as we hit 11, I saw a flood of people. So we decided we'd give it another minute. Share my entire desktop. That worked. Cool. Okay, I think I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Maggie Faber and I use she, her pronouns. I am the assessment and data visualization librarian here at UW and I am also a member of the Tableau user group steering committee. I'm really excited for today's topic on accessibility. Uh, this is a topic that I am personally interested in, uh, but more importantly, it was a topic that was suggested by a TUG attendee at, in one of our post-meeting surveys. Uh, this person wrote, I am increasingly concerned about the accessibility of our visits because 99.9% .9 of ours are for public consumption. Would be great to go over how to create accessible visits to be compatible with screen readers, etc." Um, and so we saw this comment and we were really excited to put together this session. Um, just a note that we will be sending out another survey towards the end of this meeting. So um, please know that we, the steering committee, are listening and following up on all of your suggestions. Uh, we really wanted to devote some time to accessibility and improve our collective skills in this area. So we expanded this to a 90 minute session today to give our speakers um, a substantial amount of time to, to talk through the content. Um, though you are welcome to leave if you have another meeting or to eat lunch or take a break and walk around as needed. Uh, the session is being recorded, so it will be posted to our Canvas site if there's anything that you missed or want to catch up on or want to share with um, anyone you work with. Um, and then I also just briefly wanted to mention that there are other opportunities to engage in this topic or um, expand your learning. Um, our April tug session will be a show and tell with two dashboards that have spent a lot of time on accessibility remediation, which is something that you'll be learning a little bit more about in this session today. Um, in May, my colleague Nagin will be teaching another workshop on data visualization accessibility. It won't be focused on Tableau, access, Tableau specifically, um, but her last workshop had over 70 attendees, a number of which were from this group. So I think it's gonna just get better and better. Um, and finally, there is the accessibility, the IT accessibility liaison teams that are here at UW. Um, they have an active listserv and training opportunities to learn more about accessibility broadly, not just through the lens of data viz. Um, I am just dropping that link in the chat if you want to learn more. Um, and so anyway, without further ado, I am going to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, we have Terrell Thompson and Hattie Rangan with UW IT Accessible Technology Services and Kelly Gupton, the Product Management Senior Director at Tableau Software. The three of them will be leading us in an exploration of how to ensure our data visualizations are accessible to people with disabilities. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please drop them in the chat. Uh, the presenters will address those as, uh, as, as it's possible in their presentation. And I will be keeping track of any that are missed. So we'll do a roundup at the end. Uh, and if we run out of time in the presentation, even with the extra 30 minutes, we will follow up in an email uh, or Canvas announcement. 
Um, thank you all so much for being here. And thank you, Terrell, Hadi, and Kelly for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank, thank you, Maggie. I uh, appreciate the invitation. And this actually uh, came on our radar. Uh, we, we being uh, Hadi and I, um, are members of the IT accessibility team. I uh, manage that team, which is part of the UW IT Accessible Technology Services Group. And uh, in that role, we provide uh, consultation and support on all things related to IT accessibility. So web accessibility, documents, videos, um, software, we get involved in, in procurement a lot. Um, so our, our charge is to ensure that technology is accessible across all three campuses of the university. Um, and we're using a lot of technology, obviously, and so that covers um, a, a lot of ground. And it's impossible for us to do that alone. Um, there's so much technology and so many people involved that we really depend on you. And so a lot of our time is just spent providing support and consultation and education to kind of help you the campus to um, you know make decisions that uh, that have a positive effect on accessibility of technology and and to use the tools that are available to you in the best way possible so anyway in that role as we provide you know consultation on website accessibility and so forth we've had a number of people come to us over the last maybe six months or so uh, or year um, with questions about accessibility of their websites where Tableau was involved. And so, um, so that really got us interested in exploring this a little bit further. Um, I confess that I am just, just getting my feet wet with Tableau behind the scenes. Um, so, you know, I've experimented on the front end, um, you know, with what the user experience is like, but I really don't know much about what's going on behind the scenes. So it actually has been really helpful for me to, um, to interact with Kelly over the last couple of weeks as we've been preparing for this, we have met um three occasions i think now and and looked at some dashboards together and and i feel like i'm developing a better understanding of how tableau operates as a result of that so it's great that this you know this invitation to present has sort of kicked off this um collaboration so anyway i want to start with accessibility um in general just kind of very broadly looking at this what are, what are we even talking about when we talk about accessibility well we're really talking about access to information um so you've got some sort of digital information and you need to access that or interact with that and kind of the traditional model is input that involves a keyboard and later a mouse so that those two often sort of you know combined to interact and provide input into a system where you can get data out and that output then is often through a monitor at least that has been the traditional model. So this traditional model of monitor, keyboard, mouse is how things have sort of operated for a long time. But there, that really is only a small piece of the, of the picture. And in fact, it looks a little an antiquated as we look at this now. Um, yeah, there are lots of different devices people are using. Now, this is an older slide, so it's got some older models of cell phones, but uh, but, you know, people on handheld devices, lots of different shapes and sizes, different platforms are interacting with uh, digital information, um, both input and output. Uh, we also have tablets, a variety of shapes, sizes and platforms. The choice of device has an influence on what the person actually perceives and what they're able to do and how they operate with it and interact with it. Um, and we also have people who are not getting information visually, but are getting information audibly. And that as devices evolve, this is true and possible for everyone now, but it historically has been the domain of people who have visual impairments or who are blind, that they're using a screen reader, which audibly reads the content of the of the screen or provides the digital information um, using a synthesized voice and that that is how they get their output they may still be using the keyboard probably not using mouse but for output they're getting that um, audibly 
You also have people who are providing information, providing input verbally. So not using the keyboard or the mouse, but using voice. Um, this too is expanding now. So lots of people are doing this, you know, with a hands-free sort of um, interaction that's possible on today's devices. But again, historically, this was the realm of people with disabilities who physically are unable to use a mouse or keyboard. Maybe they you know, have limited mobility. Uh, maybe they have no hands at all. Um, speech input is one viable way among many others um, that they have for providing input into the system. We also have people who um, operate with a sense of touch. So screen readers, as I mentioned, for people who are blind um, can deliver their output audibly. So they're listening to the content, um, but they can also deliver content through a braille device, which is what we see here on the slide. Um, this is a refreshable braille device where you've got a row of braille dots that changes um, as a person explores and navigates through um, the computer. And so, so they can explore that way. And this, this particular uh, Braille device also has Braille keys for input. So somebody could do all of their interacting, both input and output through this one device. Now I ran out of space on this slide. Otherwise I could have gone on and on and on about different ways that people um, use the computer. Um, you know, even visually, we have very different needs, different screen resolutions, different font sizes. The browser allows us to change our font size. And so that's going to impact our experience. So bottom line is there's a lot of diversity in the way people interact with information. So it's not um, just, you know, this old school model of a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse. That's a great oversimplification that there's a lot more variety than that. Also, I want to point out what, what you see now, assuming that you have eyesight on the screen, is a data visualization that, um, you know, this is all provided here so that you can better understand the landscape. But I also have been describing it all the while. I've told a little story here. If I just put up this slide and I said nothing, then some of you might be able to sort of figure out what I'm getting at. But the deeper message, what this, what am I, I trying to communicate here exactly? The deeper message probably would have been lost. And so, so this is a data visualization, but it's accompanied by description. And I've done my best to, to sort of make this accessible for everyone. Here's another visualization. This is ability on a continuum. We've got people who are able to do something, people who are not able to do something. And where the, where a person falls on this continuum varies depending on what it is we're measuring. So maybe it's the ability to see. Some people have 20-20 vision and don't require any assistive technology like glasses in order to attain that. Some of us fall further down on this spectrum, um, but with glasses, we move a little bit further up. Um, some people are not able to see at all. Um, and most people sort of fall somewhere on that continuum. It's not a binary thing where you've got people with disabilities, people without disabilities. You've just got a lot of variety of human experiences depending on what it is you're measuring. Same thing with ability to hear, ability to walk, ability to read print, ability to write with pen or pencil, ability to communicate verbally, ability to tune out distraction. All of these are variables that are extremely variable. So some people are outstanding at their ability to do these things. Others are unable to do them at all. And most people fall somewhere in between. Um, also, um, there's the ability to process and understand numerical or tabular data. That if we look at a large data set presented in a table, some people can, can handle that and they can you know, understand the relationships between the parts, um, particularly if they can interact with that table and can sort the data and filter it, then um, they work really well with that medium. Um, but some people don't do so well with large data sets. And this is why we have data visualization that in, in a sense it is in order to overcome people's inherent limitation when it comes to being able to process and understand numerical and tabular data. So for those people, um, there, there is 
also, um, there are data visualizations. There's presenting this data and using graphs, charts, you know, presenting it in a visual way that helps some people then to better understand it. But that doesn't work for everyone. And so again, lots of variety. Some people do better with different types of information than with others. And we're sort of all over the map when we measure our strengths and weaknesses in this regard. So I want to talk just in the way of overview about accessibility. And I do want to talk about the law. I don't like to talk about the law much, and I'm not a lawyer. So this is all from the perspective of an IT accessibility person. But, um, but we do have laws that we are required to meet. And so this is an important part of the conversation. Um, specifically for us in higher education at a public university, we've got um, two laws that are sort of on the forefront Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act that dates all the way back to 1973. Um, and the Americans with Disabilities Act um, was 1990. And then there have been amendments since then. But basically, at the heart of both of these laws is civil rights that prohibit discrimination against people with disabilities. And so um, back in 73, certainly, and even in 1990, technology was nowhere near what it is today, um, but it was just, in general, all of our programs and services and resources must be accessible to individuals with disabilities, or we are discriminating against those individuals with disabilities. Um, and so the difference in the laws is it's sort of a difference in scope, primarily, that the, the Rehab Act um, that applied to recipients of federal funding. And so that covers us. But Americans with Disabilities Act expanded that so it was more about society as a whole, not just recipients of federal funding. But nevertheless, it still uh, applies to us. So under both of these laws, we need to ensure that our programs and services and activities and resources are accessible. There, ha there have been hundreds of legal complaints filed against higher education institutions for having inaccessible IT. And those have uh, increased. If we were to actually show a visualization of this, there would be a, a line that goes up uh, dramatically over the last five to 10 years. Um, typically, those are complaints filed with the US Department Office uh, of Civil Rights. And, and then there's some negotiation that happens and then there's a resolution agreement or a settlement um, that happens in which the university agrees to certain conditions like having a high level IT accessibility policy and, and various other things. Um, and always, I think almost 100% of the time, maybe even 100% of the time, there is a requirement that the institution named in that case comply with WCAG 2. Dot, either 2.0 or 2.1. 2.1 is the most recent version, level 2A. So and I'm gonna talk in a moment about what that is, but just keep that in mind. WCAG 2.x level 2A is our expected level of accessibility compliance. That message is reinforced over and over and over and over again in uh, these uh, legal complaints. Also, Washington State um, has a policy 188. Um, this actually is an IT policy, so it comes out of the CIO's office. Um, but that says that all state agencies, including higher education institutions, are required to meet WCAG 2.1 level 2A. So, uh, so once again, I mean, it's just reinforcing what has emerged from legal cases under federal law. But the state is trying to be proactive and just trying to raise awareness that you know, this is a requirement U.S. state agencies need to pay attention to. It. So in these OCR, Department of Education um, resolutions, um, this kind of a template that, that they use. And so we see the same language over and over again in their, their uh, resolution agreements. And um, that includes a definition of accessible. Um, which I'll read here, it says accessible means a person with a disability is afforded the opportunity to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability in an equally effective and equally integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. The person with a disability must be able to obtain the information as fully, equally, and independently as a person without a disability. 
So, uh, and I highlighted, you know, the section of that, the whole thing really sort of um, is equally important, but, but I felt like, you know, I really wanted to stress in an equally effective and equally integrated manner with substantial equivalent ease of use as we explore data visualizations. Um, because a person who has no eyesight or who is not able to use a mouse, um, you know, should uh, be able to fully, you know, access the data. So, uh, what is WCAG 2, 2.0 or 2.1? You know, I've mentioned this a few times now. This is our requirement. This is what we are striving to meet. Um, it is an aspirational goal. Um, you know, I'll be frank about that, that we're far from meeting it, but we, we really need to demonstrate that we are making progress. Um, it is the, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, uh, affectionately called WCAG by its acronym, is an international web accessibility standard published by the World Wide Web Consortium or W3C. So that's the same group that brings us HTML and CSS and lots of other standards related to the web. Um, the first version was published actually in the, in the early days of the web in the 90s, they began early 90s, they began working on this you know, soon after the, the web was invented by Tim Berners-Lee and soon after the W3C was formed. They began to work on accessibility and they published the first guidelines in 1998. And since then, those guidelines have been updated twice, uh, 2.0 in 2008 and 2.1 is the latest version published in 2018. And they're continuing now actually to work on, on uh, more versions, but uh, 2.1 is the one that our policies are based on at this point. At its deepest level, it's divided into success criteria. So these are the specific measurable things that say, this is how we define web accessibility. And there are 78 of those. So there are quite a few um, very specific things that must be done in order to ensure that websites are accessible. And they apply to a lot of other you know, digital um, technologies as well. But uh, one, one thing that a lot of people are familiar with is images on alt text or alt text on images. And so you've got an image, um, you know, maybe a, a logo, University of Washington logo. As an image, a screen reader can't make any sense of that. So we put, we add alt text to it. It's text that is behind the scenes in the code that says University of Washington or maybe University of Washington logo. Um, that then makes that image accessible to somebody who's using a screen reader. And so that, that's critical. Um, and it is a, one of the success criteria of well, WCAG 2.1. And it's a level A success criteria because it's so important that without that alt text, a person using a screen reader has no access to the content of that image. So the success criteria, those 78 specific measurable things, each has a level associated with it. So level A are the highest priority, level 2A are the second highest priority, and level 3A are if you want maximum accessibility and you want to you know, really ensure that absolutely everybody has you know, equal access to your website, then you go for level 3A, all 78 success criteria. Um, and as I mentioned, though, the, the bar has been set at level 2A that we are expected to meet level A and level 2A. So that's a, a subset of 50 success criteria from, from the WCAG. So um, what, what we, how we do accessibility, IT accessibility at the UW, just so you sort of know how this all works here internally and where your supports lie. Um, there, first of all, there is an ADA compliance officer. Um, Bree Callahan is that person currently and residing in the Office of Compliance. Um, so she's kind of on a mission just to make sure that we are um, compliant and you know, raising red flags whenever you know, there are uh, seem to be big you know, risks that people are taking related to accessibility. Um, and then we have disability resources for students. Um, DRS, they provide individual accommodations to students with disabilities. So a student with a disability registers with their office, um, has documentation of their disability, and DRS then provides them the accommodations they need. 
Um, Disability Services Office, DSO, does the same sort of thing for employees and for the public. And then where we fit into that, UWIT Accessible Technology Services works to support the UW community as it strives to ensure its IT resources are accessible. And so we're working sort of more proactively to build a fully accessible IT infrastructure, whereas uh, these other groups on campus are working more sort of reactively to meet individual needs. Um, we want to try to make things accessible by default so that you know DRS and DSO and, and the ADA compliance officer don't have to do so much um, because you know, retrofitting and making individual accommodations um, often is not not great. It's you know last minute. It's really hard to fix inaccessible software, for example, you know for an individual if the software is inaccessible. And so so we're trying to tackle it up front. You know, let's make that software as accessible as possible. So our, our website, um, I didn't actually see, I'm not looking at chat now, so I didn't see what was pasted in earlier, but our the hub for our communicating with the campus community about IT accessibility issues is uw.edu slash accessibility. So you can find out more about all the things we do there. Um, and and we do, as I mentioned, provide free consulting and support to the UW community on in all these different areas. If it has a user interface, then it has the potential to uh, you know, erect barriers for certain groups of people. And so we want to make sure that anything with a user interface is, in fact, usable um, by people with disabilities. So, so I want to then shift. We've talked about sort of broadly, you know, all these different ways that people interact with technology, um, and the the fact that we need we have legal requirements that need to be met, and there are standards that we're striving to comply with that sort of define our legal responsibilities. Um, but I want to shift then to applying all that information to data visualization itself. Um, so there are two purposes, um, you know, as I see it, and again, I'm a, I'm a novice when it comes to data viz, but I've been exploring this quite a bit over the last month. Um, and, and it seems that you know, the two purposes are either explanatory to make data easier to understand, to tell a story, um, or exploratory to enable users to explore data and identify patterns and trends. Um, so I've, I've got a, just a, a screenshot of an example that is from the accessibility world that uh, there's an organization called WebAIM at Utah State University that um, had, does a, a uh, every couple of years they do a survey of screen reader users to identify kind of trends in what tools they're using, what browsers they're using, and all sorts of other things about screen reader use. Um, so this is from their results website. Um, which is kind of a breakdown of the most popular screen readers uh, or, or all the screen readers are out there and, you know, kind of a market share um, visualization. And so you've got NVDA and JAWS and Windows, those are the two that have the largest chunk of the pie here. And so visibly, I can see that, um, that NVDA actually is the market leader at 40.6%, and JAWS is second, close behind at 40.1%. Those have by far the largest chunks of the pie. And then there's a, in another pretty good size wedge at 12.9% 12, 12 voiceover. Everything else is just a tiny little slice of the pie. So, so I see that visually, but if I'm a person that processes information better through a data table, they also provide a data table. Um, and so I can, I can explore the data um, that way. So, uh, so this is a good example of you know, providing a visualization that communicates the, the idea in different ways because different people access information in different ways. So what we wanna do now that you've gotten that background um, is provide a few demos. Um, and uh, I'm gonna take just an initial look at those uh, really quickly, just to sort of walk through what I see as a sighted person who can use a mouse. Um, but we also wanna explore, you know, are these accessible or how can we maximize their accessibility? Since this is the Tableau user group, we wanna focus on Tableau to an extent, 
And uh, Kelly is here to to provide us that insight. You know, as the Tableau rep, she can share you know strategies for maximizing accessibility of a Tableau dashboard. But there are lots of things you can do to ensure your Tableau dashboard is accessible as it possibly can be. Um, we also, though, are going to explore um, a, an alternative example using high charts just to kind of you know show what's what's possible and sort of contrast visualizations that were were prepared with different tools um and my colleague Hadi Rangan uh, from accessible technology services is a screen reader user and so he's going to give us some insights on what um, that experience is like um, as a screen reader user accessing these various um, demos so with that, let me just quickly show you the visualizations that we want to look at. Um, I've got um, a browser here. This is a, a web page that I created that uh, we're going to start with. And one thing I want to point out, I've got a tool here, a bookmarklet that says headings. This is an accessibility bookmarklet. It's a tool I use for checking accessibility. If I select that, then it identifies the HTML headings on the page. It shows them clearly. You know, the data visualization accessibility is an H1. Then I've got three H2s that correspond with the different sections of the page. So this is a page that using HTML is very um, clear in the heading structure. It forms an outline of the page content. That's a really important concept when it comes to accessibility for web pages and um, PDFs and Word docs and you know everything. If it's a document that has some heading structure, that heading structure needs to be communicated to users with disabilities. And so Hadi later, when he does a demo, you'll see why this is particularly important. But uh, from here, the uh, examples I wanna show, uh, that we wanna show, first of all, there's this um, dashboard from the UW Libraries. This is a Tableau dashboard. UW Libraries profile by fiscal year. The things that jump out at me here are the quick figures, first of all. So you've got uh, what I understand from Kelly are, is, are called uh, big ass numbers bands. Um, those visually really jump out at the top of the page. But I also have individual visualizations that I can hone in on. Uh, one that jumped out at me is circula circulation that, oops, it just decided to refresh, um, that I see that uh, circulation has declined over the years. This is for all libraries and campuses. And I may be curious to know whether that is a reflection of um, Seattle more than the other campuses um, or what exactly is going on there. So I've got a form and I can, can use that to change the visualization. So there's the Seattle campus libraries. It looks pretty much like the all libraries line. But if I select Tacoma, then I see a couple of interesting changes um, here to the overall pattern that there actually was a, an upward trend in the early days from 2013 to 2014. And then more recently, another upward trend between 2018 and 2019. So I'm going to be curious to know, you know, what's going on there at Tacoma, but very quickly, you know, in 30 seconds to a minute here, I've been able to hone in on that and um, visually, and as a mouse user, was able to access that uh, interesting bit of information. So, so the question then is, can somebody that can't use a mouse or that can't see it, can they too access that? Uh, we also are gonna look at, this is a, the high charts um, demo on population of seven Nordic countries, because um, I think uh, high charts is based in Norway. So that's where we got um, this from. But, you know, there are lots of different ways that this data is presented. So the population is color coded within this map. I can see that Sweden is the highest because it's red. And I can see that a Norway, Denmark and Finland are, are a darker shade of purple than Greenland and Iceland and the Faroe Islands. So therefore, you know, I get some relationships based on the color coding in the map, but all that data is also presented in this table beneath the map, sorted by population. So really easy to figure out, um, you know, which countries have the most population. And if I am 
interested in living somewhere that is both not too densely populated, but also not growing, um, then you know I may want to look at population history and see like Sweden is on an upward trend, but what about like Finland? Finland, I see kind of flattens out a little bit. And so that's an interesting piece of information to be able to interact with this by just like on the library's dashboard, selecting different pieces of information and then um, you know, following, getting you know, a change of information based on my selection. So um, we also, if we have time, there's also a sonification example that I would like to explore. Um, this may carry over into that last 30 minutes, but and that can be a significant way to um, expose people who can't see to data trends um, and high charts is able to do that. But I also, uh, this may be the only opportunity we get to look at these two UW dashboards. Um, but again, come back in April and you'll get, both of these are actually gonna be featured. And so you'll learn more about what they did. But the fast facts um, dashboard, there's a lot of information here in this Tableau dashboard. But as you'll see, as we explore, um, both through Kelly's lens and Hadi's lens, Tableau dashboards, there are some limitations. There are things you can do to ensure this is as accessible as possible, but as accessible as possible is not perfectly accessible. And so there are gonna be some things that really need to be done through an alternative version and fast facts has provided, actually we've got three versions. We've got the Tableau version, as well as a PDF version for printing, and this text-only version, which is not just text, it's text with headings and with data tables that provides access to all of the same information, but organized in a way that's accessible if somebody that can't access the Tableau dashboard very easily. And the same thing, um, they actually did that. It was a pretty easy process, I understand, from them. Um, but that's because it's static data, whereas the COVID dashboard is dynamic. This is changing all the time. I think they have daily updates. And so this was a bit more of uh, an effort, which they can, again, they can talk about this in, in April. But um, you can, once again, view a text-only version of the dashboard and this is being generated programmatically from the same data source. So, so they've got a Google sheet as the data source and, and uh, PHP scripts that are drawing the data from that original data source and generating HTML tables um, you know, from, from that data source. And so, so they are dynamically creating an alternative version, but this is then a, you know, a more accessible presentation that accompanies uh, the Tableau version. So, so you can toggle back and forth with both of the, these examples between the two, two versions. So, so I don't think we're gonna look at these you know, text only versions, um, but other than what I've just shown you, but the bottom line is, you, know, you may be faced with, if your, your dashboard is not otherwise it gonna be, if it's gonna present some accessibility problems, then you need to be thinking about alternative versions as uh, a means of providing access um, to, to the, the information. So with that said, um, I'm gonna stop sharing and hand it off to Kelly to talk specifically about Tableau and what you can do to ensure that your Tableau dashboard is as accessible as possible. All right, thank you so much, Cheryl. Okay. Can I get a confirmation that you can uh, see my slides here? Yep, we can see them. Okay, great. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Kelly Gupton. I'm a Product Management Senior Director in the development team at Tableau. And I'm going to be talking today about basically best practices for Tableau dashboard accessibility. Terrell gave a great overview of the overall subject of accessibility, um, including the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG. And what I've come up with are a set of best practices that basically help guide you to be able to apply the basic ideas and principles inherent in these WCAG guidelines in the context of Tableau dashboards. 
And as he noted, it doesn't create a perfectly accessible dashboard, um, but it does help you deal with a lot of the core accessibility issues um, that are in Tableau dashboards, and it helps you achieve kind of the best possible result. Um, Creating accessible dashboards is not something people really try to do all that often in the Tableau world. Uh, there's been a lot more of it over the last several years, but it's still a thing that um, is pretty few and far between. And you know, this is really about achieving the best possible result uh, that there is. So let's go ahead and get into these. Um, so I have 10 best practices. Um, I'm just going to go through each of these in detail. And uh, they start really with kind of a more of a philosophical point. Uh, and Terrell actually did mention this, and he talked about the difficulty of retrofitting accessibility into existing software. So the number one thing is to design for accessibility upfront. Um, it is a design choice to design for accessibility, and accessibility should be considered a requirement for what you're creating, just like any other requirement that you might have. So, you know, when you're thinking about the requirements of a dashboard, you're thinking about, you know, what is, who is the audience, uh, what information are you trying to communicate, all of those sorts of things. And accessibility should be one of those requirements um, up front. And part of the reason for this is, is that you can't really make any arbitrary dashboard accessible. There are certain patterns and ways that people tend to use Tableau that just really don't work well for accessibility. Um, in particular, a lot of the kind of fancy ways that people lay out dashboards in order to achieve a certain visual result don't really work that well with assistive technology. And that's because assistive technology relies on the semantics of the underlying uh, web page or dashboard. And when you try to assemble Tableau dashboards in a fancy way, you kind of do this in a, in a very semantic free way that makes it difficult for assistive technology to work. So, so number one, make sure that you're designing for accessibility from the beginning and considering it upfront. The second is to make sure that you're using the elements in the dashboard that we have worked to make accessible. So there are a lot of different kinds of objects that you can place in the dashboard. And we've, we've been on a accessibility journey for a few years now, and we're kind of working on the various objects that you can put in a dashboard to make them accessible over time. Uh, in the latest version of Tableau, and this is true for about the last three versions of Tableau, uh, and just so you know, the latest version is 2021.1. We actually just released it on Friday. Um, but overall, the things that you can put in an accessible dashboard are uh, the tabs for a workbook, uh, the titles of the dashboards, views themselves, uh, in particular, the title of a view, the caption for a view, um, and most importantly, what's called the view data window. So this is a window that you can open for any view in any dashboard uh, that gives you an accessible table of the data that's underlying the visualization. Um, and this is key for providing access to that data for users of assistive technology. There are also a few filter types that we've worked on, the list and drop-down list filters, as well as the relative date filter, um, categorical legends, the objects that you can put in dashboards like text objects, web page objects, images, buttons, et cetera. And then some of the other controls like parameters, set controls, and the data highlighter. Um, I'm gonna end the presentation with pointing you at some resources online and where you can find a wealth of resources about accessibility, including this list uh, that we keep maintained um, so people know what all is out there that we've worked on. The third thing is to make sure that you have allowed the data behind the dashboard to be downloaded. Um, the reason is, is that this permission controls whether the view data page is enabled for any dashboard. Um, the view data page, again, is how an assistive technology user is able to get access to the data behind the visualization. Um, and since it's an HTML page, uh, you can actually just copy and paste the data right out of that page and put it into another document. And that's why there's a permissions um, association between the ability to download the data and the ability to open the view data window. Um, on Tableau Public, 
where most all of your visualizations that we've been looking at are stored. Uh, the option is basically to allow the workbook and its data to be downloaded. And so that option needs to be enabled in order for the view data window to be functional. Okay, now getting into some more specific techniques within Tableau. So the first thing is for any of the objects that are in your dashboard, you need to show the titles. Um, and these titles should be useful. They should be explanatory as to what the object is that's being titled. Um, the reason why titles are so important to show is that they actually show up to assistive technology as HTML headers. And as Terrell showed earlier, headers are a key way that assistive technology users use to navigate web pages. So in Tableau, if you've enabled the dashboard title, uh, that will show up as a level one header. The title for any views or visualizations in the dashboard will show up as a level two header. And then the titles for any filters, parameters, sets, or legends will show up as level three header. Um, and as our demo later will show, screen readers and other assistive technology have keystroke combinations and such, which allow users to jump to various headers, list off the headers in, in the uh, page, and so on and so forth. So good, clear, visible titles are essential in order to enable that sort of navigation for Tableau dashboards. The next thing to do is to show captions that describe the views in your dashboard. So if a caption is visible on the dashboard, a assistive technology like a screen reader will be able to read that caption. And captions in Tableau can actually even have some dynamic elements. And so, you, so what that means is for data that's in the visualization, you can actually put some of that data in the text of a, of a caption and have that be dynamic. So if the data changes, the caption will change. So I have an image of a histogram um, from a dashboard that I created about SAT scores of students at a hypothetical university. Um, in this particular case, the title of this view is called is number of students by SAT score. And I've created a caption that basically just gives a high level overview of what this, this chart contains, what data the chart contains. And so the, the caption for this particular chart reads, number of students by SAT score is a histogram showing number of students by SAT score. SAT score is on the X axis, number of students is on the Y axis. Blue squares represent female students, Orange, square, orange circles represent male students. The reference line displays the average SAT score. Um, and of course, if I wanted to, I could have put some data in there as well. But this, what will happen is if a screen reader user, for example, is interacting with this Tableau dashboard and they bring the keyboard focus to a visual, this visualization on the dashboard, the screen reader will first read the title of this visualization then it'll read the caption of the visualization, and then it'll give the keystroke combination for opening the view data window. And so the caption is very useful to provide an overview um, for a user so that they can determine whether or not the view data window um, or opening the view data window is something that they might want to do to examine the data in detail. I did mention um, using the keyboard to navigate the dashboard. So the next thing to do is to set a logical key focus order um, for the dashboard so that as a user moves around the dashboard using um, say the tab key, or if they have assistive technology enabled arrow keys, um, that things move in a logical way, uh, typically kind of a top to bottom, left to right type navigation. Unfortunately in Tableau today, uh, setting that up is not typically or not very easy thing to do. Uh, the default keyboard focus order is a bit nonsensical in that it's determined by literally the order in which you drop items into a dashboard, uh, which is not typically from top to bottom and left to right. Uh, right now we have a workaround for doing that that involves editing the workbook XML for the workbook that the dashboard is in. Um, and there's a topic on the Tableau community forums that I wrote, basically giving instructions on how to edit the workbook XML in order to set the focus order correctly. Um, this is something that we're working on. 
Uh, we're looking to ship later this year so that dashboards will by default have a logical top to bottom, uh, left to right focus order. Next is to make sure that you're using text colors with sufficient contrast. Um, so this is one of the guidelines in the WCAG is to make sure that there's enough contrast between the foreground and the background of the text color um, that everyone who is, or people who, with issues discerning contrast are still able to read that text. So on the left of the slide, I have the word accessibility printed in a light gray. Uh, this actually does not meet the standards. Um, and on the right, it's a much darker gray that does meet the standards. There's a very useful tool out there called the Color Contrast Analyzer, uh, which basically allows you to sample the color of the foreground and background, and it will tell you whether or not the difference meets the standards for the WCAG, and it's quite useful. Another thing to do is in your visualizations, make sure not to use only color to convey information. So Tableau does have a colorblind color palette, but it's specifically designed to account for red-green colorblindness, which while is the most common type of color vision deficiency, it's not the only type of color vision deficiency. And so if you're attempting to convey information and you convey it in a way that uses color only, then people with various color vision deficiencies may have difficulty understanding the chart that you're displaying. And so there are a number of different techniques that you can use, and it's very dependent on the type of visualization. Um, you might choose to use shapes rather than colors. Uh, you might use labels on top of bars in a bar chart, for example. But what I have here is an image of a line chart um, where I have the line chart basically has different categories that are mapped to different colors. So you have orange lines and blue lines and gray lines. Um, but, you know, if I left it that way, it would use only color to distinguish those categories. Um, so what I did here is I used a dual axis chart in Tableau and on the secondary axis, basically plotted the same data using shape marks, which basically results in those shapes being overlaid on top of the lines. So that way someone could distinguish the lines um, by the lines with squares or the lines with triangles, uh, lines with circles and so forth so that we have an alternate method besides color to convey that information. Number nine is there are some of the objects that you can put on a Tableau dashboard allow you to set um, different text properties. And these text properties can be read by assistive technology. So for image objects, on the left, I have a screenshot of the edit image object dialog. So for images that you've put on a dashboard, there is an alt text field. And that alt text field basically allows you to enter text that a assistive technology device or screen reader will read when a user navigates using a keystroke combination to that image on the dashboard. For buttons, and this is both for navigation and for export buttons, there is a tooltip field and that tooltip text is picked up by assistive technology to help a user understand what pressing that button uh, will do or activating that button, um, which they can do using the keyboard. And then the last um, tip that I have here is to just use text objects on the dashboard to give instructions and context for that dashboard. Um, this is really useful for everyone to help give an overview of what information is, is in that dashboard. And it's particularly useful for users of assistive technology to help them orient themselves as to what might be the various filters in the dashboard, what views are in the dashboard, what data they contain, and so forth. And you can even provide some more instructions for how to use assistive technology with those uh, objects in the dashboard. And of course, assistive technology can read the text that's in a text object. And then finally, there are a couple of new guidelines in the WCAG 2.1, which are relevant to Tableau dashboards. Uh, the first is that this version of the WCAG introduces an additional contrast requirement around non-text contrast. So this is for user interface objects, marks in a data visualization, and so forth. 
Now, this is a bit of a tricky one to handle. Um, it's quite difficult to create a complex data visualization that meets all of the various color contrast requirements along with the use of color requirements and so forth. And I think we need some more creative ways um, to help individual users, end users customize visualizations to meet their own needs. Um, but for now, uh, an enterprising member of the Tableau community created a set of colorblind custom color palettes that you can find on our community forum. Um, it's various sets of color palettes to adapt for different types of color vision deficiency, but all of them actually do meet the WCAG 2.1 non-text non contrast guidelines. Um, so they can be useful for this. And then finally, the WCAG 2.1 also introduces new requirements around reflow to make sure that user interfaces can scale appropriately um, when a browser is zoomed in up to 400%. Um, browser zoom is very common for people with low vision to help them be able to see and discern the information in a web page. And a web page or anything in the web page should adapt correctly for that. And just a week before last, I published a blog post on our community about how to use the existing Tableau functionality around you know, resizing layout containers and alternative dashboard layouts um, or device specific dashboard layouts in order to meet the WCAG 2.1 reflow criteria. Um, it goes into a fair amount of detail about how to do this as it can be kind of tricky to make a dashboard scale and resize and relay out properly. Um, but it's quite possible to do this for, you know, the kinds of dashboards that people typically create. Okay, so that's the end of the tips. Um, I do want to point everyone at a very important page on our community forums called the Accessibility FAQ. Um, I've basically used that topic to pull together all of the, the resources that we have about accessibility in Tableau in one place. Um, so there you can find our accessibility conformance reports, which is a way that we communicate our you know, uh, conformance with the guidelines. Um, we have links to all of the product documentation for the uh, creating accessible dashboards. I have numerous tips and tricks that I've created to help address some of the more common questions that people have come up with. Uh, there are some videos of me doing presentations at our conferences that go into even more detail on these things and how they relate to the various WCAG guidelines. Um, and then there are some demos. Uh, in, in particular, there's one demo, it's a YouTube video showing how it's, what it's like basically to use a Tableau dashboard using the keyboard and a screen reader. And so hopefully this presentation kind of piques your interest and you can take it from here and go to the accessibility FAQ and learn more about accessibility, um, certainly, Feel free to ask any questions in the community. I monitor it uh, for questions related to accessibility and usually pretty engaged there. Uh, and I hope that you're able to start creating more accessible content uh, in Tableau now. And that is the end of my portion of things. So I'm gonna stop my screen sharing as well. Of course, now I can actually see any uh, comments in the, in the chat. It was a, a question for both of us, Kelly, as to whether we were going to share our slides. I said I, I definitely intend to share mine. I assume you are going yes. to share yours as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll send off a, a, a PDF of the slides uh, back to the organizers so they can be sent off. Okay. Good, good morning. There is one more minute to the top of the hour before it becomes officially noon. So now we have gone through the boring part of the presentation now we are getting to the exciting part of the presentation thank you uh, uh Teriol, thank you kelly for the uh for for your uh, portion this is, this is a lot of good inform uh, information about accessibility and thank you kelly for the sharing the tips and of course thanks to the the, the team for inviting us to share our uh uh, to an opportunity to discuss accessibility of this visual, uh, data visualization too. So, um, 
And I have been told that typically it is uh, the meeting is for one hour. Hopefully you guys can stay for another 30 minutes uh, to see the, the exciting part of the presentation. So my name is Hadi Rangin, a member of IT accessibility team. Uh, if you are with uh, UDAP, uh, you probably, I, in, the, in the past year, I have been involved in some of the accessibility project uh, with you and then had the chance to work with you in one way or another. My primary responsibility is that to make sure that the software that we develop here on campus or we purchase are accessible. So uh, we are involved in a lot of accessibility testing and evaluation and collaboration with the vendors as, as well as with the, our local uh, designer and developers. So I'm going to share my screen. I mean, it, it happens that I am blind and I use a screen reader and then um, uh, Again, I, this is one of the, uh, the topics that I found it extremely, extremely difficult uh, to understand and read and then discover. You know, when we, as, as a screen reader user, or when you, as a non-blind uh, or a screen reader user, look at the interface, within a fraction of a second, you can identify the major object on the page, the, the design, you can see what is what, and then depending on what, why you are on that page, you can uh, narrow down your fo focus and then see uh, and, and then dive into that section that you came for. For a screen reader user, it is, is very different. We do not see as a the page as a whole, we see only one element at the time. So we see, for example, one, Heading, uh, we see one piece of uh, static text at the time. We see one uh, form control, like a button or like a, a text box uh, or, or link, all as a in independent and individual elements. And then we do not see the relationship, the visual relationship between these elements unless uh, you guys provide uh, uh, the, the or, or unless the, the, there are structures behind those elements. So uh, let me share my screen. I hope- uh, Select a window or an application, then you want tab control. Basic tab select the sharing list box. Press arrow key to navigate the list. Press control, share some checkbox, not check, check. Select optimize for video clip, check the share screen button. Okay, I am now going to up by, by piping my, my uh, screen, you are screen alert. to the system. Uh, Terriol, can you tell me this is the volume level for the screen reader is... Uh, data vision. Is it okay? Is it a little too loud? It could be a, just a little bit louder, perhaps. Louder. Okay, so, so, so make sure everybody is awake. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, here on this landing page for the examples that we are going to look into, um, you know, I'm not going to really dive into very much details, but one of the basic elements that we see in every page uh, as, as a guidance for a navigation is the heading structure. Um, these are so important that uh, really if you are not there, we need to read everything for every page from top to bottom to understand what the page is about. And then it's interestingly, when you read the entire page, then you see that it is not relevant. So you, it is a perfect waste of time. <laughs> so uh, screen reader provide a lot of uh, means to help uh, people uh, or basically blind people to um, get some information about their page. One of them is the headings. Um, and they have a lot of shortcut keys that there are a lot of shortcut keys that we use to navigate with the page. So uh, for anything that I uh, interact in this mode, um, screen, my screen reader is intercepting that and then tries uh, uh, inter uh, inter in interprets it as a command. For example, if I type letter H. Data visualization accessibility heading level one. So it took me to the heading one, which is a, it's a, the data visualization. So it, that is good. The page start with the heading one. So I know that the, what the page is about. That is what the, the, what the purpose of the heading one is. So I move to the next heading. Main landmark tab, low heading level two. Uh, then it is the, uh, uh, the, the about Tableau, uh, this is another heading, which is a heading two. 
Uh, so I know that it is a major section of the page. Microsoft Power by heading level two. Then we, the next heading is about uh, Microsoft uh, uh, Power BI. And then the next one cards heading level two. is about the high chart. So this heading mechanism is not only helps me to understand the structure behind the page uh, on the page, it also helps me to navigate to the desired section. So, so important. And this is an important that Kelly also mentioned and, and, and both uh, Terry and Kelly mentioned that. And then uh, I do not know at this time if it happens autom automatically in, uh, in, in Tableau or not, but it is so critical that uh, uh, otherwise it will be a total failure. So let's navigate to some of these uh, pages, uh, some of these examples that we want to look into. Microsoft low heading level two. A library's assessment visited. So I think we decided to showcase this example. Um, I'm going to open the app. Document busy plan. Actually, if you, Document how do you, if you go plan. back, there's there are two UW libraries links. I apologize. That was the, the one. Visualization accessibility test. Ellie Gupton link. List with three items. A library's oh, profile visited. Yeah, link. that's the one. This one. Okay. A library's profile. Google Chrome. A library's profile. Document busy plan. A library. Efrain Santiago has left the meeting alert. A library's profile. Uh, document. If you are leaving my screen, if you are leaving my screen reader, will let me know. So. <laughs> Stay there. Hang. <laughs> uh, okay. I am on that page. Data visualization. And consider me on this page. Uh, I mean, I have uh, had the chance to meet with, uh, uh, to talk about this page and this example for some, several hours with Terriol and, and Kelly. So I have some idea what is on the page, but discovering the functionality and all those information of the page. It is so cumbersome, so difficult, and then sometimes inaccessible. So on this page, for example, I think Kelly is referring to them as a bands. Those big information that you see there, I completely miss it. And I didn't know that. I mean, the, even Terry didn't know that I, don't, I do not see them. But this is, for example, one of the biggest problem that uh, we do not see. So as a workaround solution, Kelly mentioned that, or I think Terry also emphasized that, it is always good to provide your message, I mean, the author provides the message of the information of, the, of, the, of these charts or of this uh, visualization to explain that in plain English, what the page is about, and what are the highlights of it? That is a common practice that we also recommend to the old professors and the instructors who create the course material, saying that you know, do not expect that you put a chart there and everybody understands that. So if the, the, the we we also always recommend to provide the data table that the chart is driven from, as plus uh, the, the summary. Uh, of the message, what uh, is on that chart or what uh, user should uh, see and understand. Okay, here. Button unavailable, undo button unavailable, redo button unavailable. Okay, uh, I do not. Data visualization. For... Since uh, interacting with this, when we be in a screen reader, we usually have two modes, reading mode, which we call that a kind of also discovery mode to just see that what is around. And then uh, in that mode, we see practically every object that it is exposed to a screen reader. That bands that, that, uh, the, that are, are on the top of the page, they are not exposed to a screen reader. So we do not see. And then uh, the uh, other elements, depending on what the order of the uh, of the linear uh, of, of those elements are, uh, it could vary. Kelly mentioned that you know some of this uh, tab order might not be correct. So if it is not correct, then we do not we do not see them in 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 context. So we see some information mixed up. And then we do not necessarily uh, can understand uh, based on what we see that because they are not in the right order. 
But let's uh, interact uh, here uh, in, in this page, uh, or let me go first, try to button unavailable undo button. understand the, the, the heading. Elements list dialog, tree view. Uh, button unavailable application, da data visualization graph, data visualization. I'm sorry. Applicable data visualization. I'm trying to find my way here. Elements list dialog, tree view, gate count trend over time one of five. These are the headings used on this page, which is uh, really important. There is uh, some problem with the order of the heading three and heading two, but you know, uh, hopefully the Tableau can manage that and fix that. Circulation two of five level zero. Gate count trend over time one of five level zero. Circulation two and of five level zero. Research consultation. These are the subjects. I still I cannot say the list of the headings that we see here. Uh, it or are representing the headings of the page properly or not. There is no way for me to, to determine that unless I check with somebody who can see that and, tell and, go with, and goes uh, one by one through this heading and tells me this is uh, in line with what you see that. But we wanted to uh, see the, uh, I think the circulation that uh, Teriyal mentioned that and see that how much I understand from the circulation. Type, group, cancel button. Um, I'm sorry. 5, 2019. Clickable circulation heading level two. I got to the circulation section, and then I am going to interactive mode. Circulation graphic, press S to clear any mark selections. To open the view data window, press control, shift, enter. A lot of verbiage, but it, it didn't it just, it is a graphic, and it, it, it told me that how you can see the data behind that chart. So data visualization graphic press S to clear any mark selections. To open the view data window, press control shift enter. That is another visualization data that I have no idea it is a difference between what was the what is the difference between the previous one and this one. Research consultations graphic press. And then we go to the next topic. So uh, and the, the filter, unfortunately, is not in the neighborhood. It is way farther down where I can select the, you know, the campus. So if if Terio or Kelly didn't to, didn't didn't to, they tell me that you know there is a filter there, I wouldn't be able to discover that at all. But let's go to one of circulation. Let's right? see one of these chart. How much I see that? Uh, Terio, is it the chart that we want to look? Eric Schieffer has left the meeting alert. Yep, you're on the circulation visualization now. Okay. Uh, it, uh, I have been told, you know, to press Control Shift Enter to open that in a uh, the data. So I am opening that. Heading level one view data. So what you see, it is a data uh, associated with that. Uh, the data visualization that I see that completely in a static environment. So Tab main landmark showing first seven rows. So it is it is nice. I mean the information has been uh, organized in a table. Summary table with eight rows and two columns. Summary. Cap. And then I can read the table. Not in a table cell. Okay. Row one acad. Row two five twenty. Sum count edge of table. Academic edge of row three five twenty fourteen. Sum count column two three hundred ninety one thousand two hundred thirty two. So I see this data, but in a, in a summary uh, form, but there is also a full data. Acro, acro, ac if I can item. find it out of table list of showing first seven row tab selected summary tab full data, full data full selected. Now the table main landmark table with two hundred one rows. Two hundred one rows. Now consider if somebody wants to read the data and then make the conclusion that Terriel was able to see within maybe a few seconds that you know that the, the, the trend uh, uh, of, of uh, circulation uh, has been changing you know, since 2013 or whatever, 14. So I have to go Academy through this data. Group. Row two, Seattle campus filter campus group. Column three, Seattle campus libraries. Row three, Seattle campus library. Row four, Seattle and campus so five, on, Seattle. Row so six, on, Seattle so campus. On. Seven, Seattle. Row eight, Seattle cam campus filter. Column four, true. Circ type column five, initial circ. Count column six, two thousand. Edge of table. Okay. Circ type column five, row nine. So consider, 
understanding this huge table and determining what 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 uh, you guys see that immediately here um, library. on this page and if i want to filter that then as i said first filter was not in immediate neighborhood data research i have to go construction data visual 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 reference questions ask question point form landmark select campus all library now i have access to the form yeah bar go to tab i'm sorry application form landmark select campus all libraries and campuses Okay. Tool bar. Go to tab. Low public button. Question point not selected one. So I lost my reference questions at question form landmark. Select campus Seattle campus libraries. Select campus Seattle campus libraries. Select campus Tacoma campus okay, libraries. Okay, now, now I can access it. So I selected ta Tacoma, but it even doesn't tell me the graph has Select changed. Select campus Tacoma campus library. Okay. Uh, and now, if I want to see the, the Tacoma data, I have to go back. Data visual. 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 Instruction sessions. Research console. Tape date. Circulation graphic. Press S to clear and data visualization graphic. Circulation graphic. Data visualization graphic. I I guess this is the, the this one. The Terrell, can you verify that, please? Uh, actually, you've, you've bypassed it, but that. A couple of comments, um, and th you know, this is uh, we have met. Hadi and I and Kelly have all met and explored this dashboard and, and some others over the last week, um, and learned a lot um, from each other. I think, but and I just learned this actually that the what you seem to be on now is one of those bands. So they do show up. Each one is an individual uh, visualization. So right now. Um, the quick figures, there are 83 instruction sessions. And so that's showing up as its own visualization. And you could then access the number 83 by doing control shift enter now and going into view data mode and seeing a table of, it would be a table of one row and you know one or two columns. So that's a lot, you know, a lot of steps to get that one data point, but, but these are accessible via that. Uh, means. Yep. The other thing is circulation. Since there is some heading structure here, you could um, probably use the H key to get back to the circula circulation uh, I was, heading. I was there. I was. Yeah, I was circulation and then I was yeah. the forward. Uh, no, I, I have to again, I have to move, switch back and forth between reading mode and interactive mode. Circulation graphic presses to clear is this one? Yeah. Because since they have the same label, there's no way for me to say that maybe all of them is said that uh, visualization, something like that. I mean, it's very the same. Now. So then I can open that selection because I chose Tacoma now in a static way. So uh, as you see, these are the uh, very cumbersome, and then despite all those accessibility effort that has gone into that, is is, is uh, semi accessible, and then not definitely not easy, definitely not easy to to access that. But this is a way how Tableau does that, and then we are hoping that in colla uh, collaboration cooperation with with uh, Kelly and then and Tableau we can. Uh, improve the level of accessibility and then ease the communication between application and then a browser. So a screen reader can obtain the information. Uh, as uh, Terriel mentioned, there are some other uh, tools in the market that we have been working with. Um, high charts is one of them. Um, and then uh, I had the chance to work with them in the past. I really didn't work with them in the past, uh, in the recently. But I'm very delighted to know that they have also taken accessibility uh, seriously. And they have, uh, we, we contacted them last Friday and they, they created a few examples for us. Uh, libraries, profiles, data visualization, accessibility, SAT entry, list with one, list with four items, high cards, accessibility, demos, visited link, population of seven. This North one that the Terrell uh, told us, you know, that we would like to, that we look into that. And, your link graphic to get missed toolbar. 
View site information menu button secure. Address and search bar at JS Fiddle document. Link graphic to get missing image descriptions. Open the context JS Fiddle document. Link graphic to get missing image descriptions. Main landmark. Edit. You went in to uh, edit the code, Hadi. Out of edit multi line. Out of edit clickable one. Fill down pointing small triangle. So JS yeah, there you go. Link graphic visited link edit and JS fiddle. Clickable run this fiddle run code on. Now, this is probably is not as complex as uh, the, the, the Tableau examples that we had, but it is showing that, you know, the population growth in in nordic uh, country frame region world bank.org link figure population of seven nordic countries high cards interactive chart region clickable sweden Value. so this and is the the stuff that you know they have created i mean the, the problem is that what we would like is that we would like to uh, see the interaction in the same manner same place as others so we cannot we, sh we should not study the data offline. We want to, I mean, th th this is the reason why we make it interactive uh, 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 chart or, or visualization. And then when, 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 we, when we make it, this is a purpose for that. So we, we need to see the same interaction level uh, right in that chart, not in a different page. So that, that is what I would like to see that in Tableau, that we have that interactivity right in the chart, not that we are redirected to a different page and study just the data. Data is okay, it is wonderful to have the, 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 the associated data table, but it should be, the, one should be able to study the table and then interact with the table, with, with the uh, visualization table, with the dashboard, right Random landing guide. page. So, uh, View chart menu button if I, World Bank clicking on countries in the map will display population details for that country in the adjacent. So that is the uh, interesting uh, information that Kelly had also in, in her uh, the tips that you convey the message, you tell the highlights of the, of the visualization that everybody can see that. And, and it seems that uh, Tableau has the mechanism to provide that summary for description. Figure population of seven Nordic countries. Interact, interactive chart. Let me now be in interactive mode. Premium. Interact Value. with it. World Bank.org link figure. Population of seven Nordic countries. Denmark. Value. 5,818,553 population. So, Graphic. So yes, you may find as I move with the keyboard. I'm, Nicholas Simon has left the meeting alone. I am using the keyboard. Finland. Value. 5,520,314 population. Graphic. It told me that the population of Finland, but if I want to go to Norway, Norway value, five million three hundred forty-seven thousand eight hundred ninety-six population graphic. And then I'm pressing tab key. Zoom chart button. Zoom out chart button. View chart menu button collapsed. I'm sorry, hold on. Selected country. Combo box Sweden collapsed. Okay. Showing details for Denmark, then Finland. Norway. Showing details for you know, Norway. as soon as the, the data loads, it tells me that the data is ready. That is a wonderful thing. That that we need such such inter feedback, real time feedback, also in Tableau. That we know that the chart has been loaded and it's ready. Figure population history. Norway. High cards interactive chart. Region interactive chart graphic. One nineteen eighty four four million one hundred forty thousand ninety nine. Graphic. So I am in the, this inter, in, in table and I'm using just arrow key. The I'm using me. the arrow key to do the, the next value. Two, 1989, 4, Tells me that they go from 1999. Three, 1994, 4, 3, 1994, that's what 89. 4, 1999, 4, 5, 2004, 4,591,910. Graphic. That's, and then if I want to see for example, some of the examples of the, the uh, cities that have grown. Figure, most populated cities. High most interact. populated city. And Oslo, 1,467 population. Graphic. Probably there are more interactivity on, that, uh, on, the, uh, on the dashboard that I don't have access. 
but it is a project in progress because they really created over the weekend for us. And then, uh, but this, this shows that uh, it demonstrates that what an accessible visualization tool should be able to do that. So what I am uh, emphasizing that the path should be to provide interactivity, accessible interactivity model right on the chart and do not necessarily redirect them to just st study the uh, you know, data table and then determine from the huge table uh, to make your determination. Yes, researchers might need that, but not every visitor is a researcher. So back to you, Terry. Uh, with uh, five Video, minutes alert. left, I guess um, we could open up to any Q and A. Uh, there's nothing new. There have been a lot of uh, you know messages of appreciation in the chat. But if anybody has questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, Hadi, I wonder if you uh, might also look at the sonification example just real quickly in a couple of minutes, um, see what uh, sonification is all about. So I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Sonification. Uh, data, data visualization and accessibility. San Francisco art sonification demo. Document busy plan. Yeah. Sonification iCarts document. Again, these are, this is also one, one, one way of doing, of doing that. It is uh, really interesting. I am not a person that who personally do not use it because I'm really not sure that I can understand the sonification. But I think with some practice, people can do that, can understand that, give us some idea. Skip navigation, but link, let me... landmark, main navigation, list, products, link, sub menu, products, list, high cards, link, high card. High cards stock link high cards stock. High cards maps link high high cards scan link high cards high cards editor link high cards set high cards wrappers and add ons link wrappers and add ons demo link sub menu demo list high cards demos link high cards demos. You're in the navigation menu link. currently, Heidi. So I, 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 stock, stock I haven't uh, since I was not I didn't prepare I didn't know where it is. Okay, so let me do that. Main landmark sonification number heading level. Is it three. here in the main landmark? Number yep. link direct link to heading heading level three. High cards example frame code pen link. JS fiddle link. Figure play chart of sound. High cards interaction. Which one? This one? Then can you tell me? Yep, you're on you're on the uh, one of the lines now in the two line chart. Toggle series visibility region. Show San Diego toggle button chart menu region. View chart menu button collapsed. Play button. Courtney Berger Levinson has left the meeting alert. Okay. Let me, as he's playing two graphs at the same time. Figure. Play chart of sound. Chart menu list. Level one view and full screen one of nine. Nah. Dan, toggle series visibility region. Show New York toggle button pressed. Not pressed. Chart menu region. View chart menu button collapsed. Toggle series visibility region. Show San Diego toggle button pressed. Chart menu region. View chart menu button collapsed. Chart menu, chart menu region. View chart menu button collapsed. Toggle series visibility region. Show San Diego toggle chart menu region. View chart menu button collapsed. Where is the play button? Try tabbing it again, I think. One more time. Toggle series visibility region. Show San Diego toggle button pressed. No, it doesn't go. Interactive chart graphic. San Diego, line one of it's two. either tab one or one shift tab, place. whichever. Region. I'm not sure which direction. <laughs> Nope. I would say tab forward. Keep tabbing and forward. Figure. Play chart of sound. Okay. High cards interactive chart. Toggle series visibility think, interactive chart graphic. I think it's going to give a piece by two. piece. But uh, if, you, if you can see, because, okay, because I, I didn't really look into that, uh, if you want to play at your end, feel free to do it. Okay, well, we're pretty much out of time. I think uh, folks probably got the idea from that uh, one example. And listening to two lines at the same time would be a real cognitive load for most people, though some some might be able to handle that. But I think, you know, uh, I imagine like the uh, library circulation line, um, you know, where there was a little blip in the Tacoma um, timeline. And so, you know, if you were to listen to Seattle and Bothell and Tacoma, um, you would hear that Tacoma has some uh, unique patterns 
and particularly for really large data sets where going item by item by item through the line is going to be prohibitive, um, to be able to listen to a much larger data set, it could be really valuable. And I know we actually, um, there was a conference we were at a couple of years ago uh, that had a keynote, Wanda Diaz Merced, who is an astronomer who is blind, and she she makes a lot of use of um, uh, sonification to explore the universe and really huge data sets and has made some really contribu important contributions to the field by accessing data in this way. So, so it does have a place, I think, in the data. You, know, you think of data visualization, you think of um, eyesight, but it really is more than that. You can visualize, in a sense, with sound and, and by exploring you know, with keyboard and lots of different ways to, to visualize data. So we're right at 12.30 and I do appreciate everybody sticking around um, and hopefully this, uh, this was meaningful. Um, I know that I, I've, I've learned a lot, um, both uh, you know, from Hadi and from Kelly and from all the exploring that we've done. And again, you know, those the two example sites from the UW where they, you know, because of the limitations of Tableau, they had to go the alternative version route in order to make you know, the data explorable as well as tell their story. Um, you know, that's all going to be on on uh, tap for the, the April um, tug meeting. So I encourage everybody to come back and to hear some more about um, what they those uh, folks did. I want to also thank everyone for coming and then I appreciate the user group for inviting us. Indeed, thank you so much. Yeah, this is really excellent. Maggie, do you want to wrap things up for us? Just thanks everyone who stuck around this long. Thanks Mike to the presenters and uh, we'll see you all next month. Thanks very much.